Hello everyone, welcome to the Jenkins Infrastructure Weekly Team Meeting. Today we are 30 of May 2023. Uh, around the table we got your servitor Damien Duportal. Hervé Lemur is off today. Mark Waite is there, Stéphane and Bruno. Oh, collaborative de destruction of the notes. Perfect. Um, let's get started with announcements. The weekly release 2.407 has been released successfully, at least for the packaging part, including the Docker image. So that means, Stefan, you are ready whenever you want and can. Uh, you can update uh, weekly and uh, in FRACI. Yeah, it's, it's, it's currently happening. If container images are verified, change log is published. Uh, I've there are a few more items on the checklist to do, but they'll probably be done before the end of this meeting. Cool. Mark, just to double check because we mentioned it one or two weeks ago. So it looks like that creating the tag on the Jenkins CI slash Docker repository uh, was effective and in the few minutes. 10 minutes after that, only the new release version was pushed to the Docker Hub successfully. Is that correct? Yes. So I I'm I created I'm created the 2.407 tag in my local repository and then did a git push minus minus tags. Unfortunately, that pushed four tags, not one, because I apparently had some some latent tags sitting in my private repository, in my working repository that were not on the on the remote. I promptly deleted three of the four tags because they were junk tags that didn't belong there. Um, but I was worried that I might have damaged the build process. But Damian, you said that it had safety checks that it would not attempt to push a tag that was too old. So those uh, safety yeah. checks worked. Exactly. Uh, the the setup of the of the job on trusted CI, the current setup is uh, discovers all existing tags. If a tag is the removed, then remove it immediately from the build history. And finally, uh, don't build, don't trigger a build for tags older than three days. Which means if by error some someone changes a tag from the past, that's the situation you were in, that won't rebuild and override the existing image. Great. Thank the you. downside of that setting is that if you want to rebuild a tag for a security reason, you have to manually trigger the build to force the system to trigger it. Otherwise, it won't pick it by itself. Thank you. Now, now that leads to the a, a future topic of we need to append a build number suffix to the end of our of our our tags, right? Because two point four zero seven, while correct is actually not giving us the facility to do a rebuild of something if we were to need to do it. Exactly. But that will be the topic of the SIG platform. Okay. But of course, that's the next step. But now for the infrastructure part today, we have demonstrated that now we are not overriding the tags, the existing tags, unless we specifically trigger a build and that allows the contributor to have their pull request merge uh, way faster. So in, in fact, that was not a mistake from you. That was a, a test of the actual working of that feature. That's well done. Yeah, the difference between a mistake and a test is, is very slim in that case. Got it. <laughs> and now that means for infrastructure, the next step for us will be to to see, I propose we wait for tomorrow's LTS. And after and next week, we discuss again the topic of automating the release, the, the part build the Docker container image from the release. That could be as simple for today as release CI once finished the packaging, or maybe maybe it can start earlier, but at the moment in time, the, the weekly release process should be able to create the tag on the repository by itself. That would automatically trigger the build on trusted CI. That could be a first step to avoid someone having to do it as part of the release process. 
So I propose we wait for uh, next week for discussing this one. Good for you? Yes. Let me take note of that element. Do you have other announcements? Uh, yes, 2.407 is the first release that will warn users of our CentOS 7 container image that the operating system that that container image is delivering will not be supported after November 16, 2023. So you may see noise in online forums. You may see noise in various places saying, hey, Jenkins is now telling me that we're not going to support CentOS 7 anymore. And the correct answer to that is yes, that is accurate. Beginning mid-November of 2023, the Jenkins project will no longer support CentOS 7. Yeah, it's Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 is the is the base, but the the vast majority of users are probably actually using CentOS, not not Red Hat, not Oracle Linux, and not Scientific Linux. Nice. Expect and there will be a blog post. Uh, oh, isn't it? It is today, isn't it, Bruno? So I'll publish the blog blog, blog post. We've got approval, yeah, I think so. and today was the targeted day for it. I was thinking the day day was tomorrow, but I'll publish that blog post right now. Thanks. I'm excited. It says that will that will help a lot on any on a lot of cases. We should add the 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 link of the blog post on that comment here. Yes, please help us. Collaborative notes and things. I will uh, open the PR and blah blah blah. Yeah, I'll I'll put I'll put it in there because the blog will be published within the next um, next few minutes. <laughs> um, upcoming calendar next weekly next week. 2.408. We have an LTS tomorrow. If I'm not mistaken. Correct. 2.401.1. So please don't break the infrastructure tomorrow. Uh, we I haven't seen any advisories published. So we should not expect uh, public, uh, public advisories on the mailing. Um, I don't know about next major events. Yeah. So is there any announcement or calendar item or can we proceed to the, the operational tasks? Okay, so then the task that we were able to finish. Um, we invited uh, a student from the GSOC project to the plugin Hills core repository and the associated team. We had to work on different areas because uh, we were unsure about the initial need, but looks good for Adrian. So. I've closed the issue. Uh, we, we, if there is something missing, you will reopen, give details, and we will fix it. A user lost their password. So as usual, I, that will be worth checking Google indexation of account Jenkins IO, but we have more and more, again, user that just send that kind of request as if they search a bit too quickly. I guess, that's correlated with the uprising of ChatGPT. And I'm afraid that maybe ChatGPT could send people to account Jenkins IO. I'm not sure how to deal with that. No, I'm not really interested into doing things with ChatGPT. So anyone with good idea or knowledge or skills on that part could help us. Maybe my theory is wrong, but if that's the case, influencing ChatGPT to tell them to not open, not redirect users to open issues there could be a great, uh, great thing. Maybe we should ask ChatGPT what to do to not have yeah. ChatGPT. Yeah, we, <laughs> you can, I'm not creating an account there anymore. Uh, thanks Mark for handling that. Uh, thanks, Stefan, for working on ensuring that Popper's GS, Popper's GS2, and Bootstrap 4 were removed from all of our controller, controllers, sorry, with all the involved chaos that we can have between the Docker images, the Puppet managed, the manually managed, everywhere. Anything to add on that topic, Stefan? Uh, no, 
except that we may add matrix on, on that kind of removing, but that's not the aim of your question, I'm assuming. No, it was just in case I forgot something. Uh, nope. I don't think there is a, a task or a feedback or a post-mortem to do in this task, right? No. Cool, thanks for that. Uh, I see you closed the Azure RM64 virtual machine. So that means we are we effectively stopped using AWS for infra CI, the Jenkins.io, uh, including credential and plugin removal. Is that correct? I think I've done everything. Cool. Thanks. Uh, next step for me will be to check the impact on the AWS billing, most probably later this week or beginning of new month. Um, I think that will be a minor uh, jump compared to the uh, update center cost, but I'm sure that will be visible for this month. Another account that has issue, so jumping. Auto link references for core. I have no idea what this issue is. I assume it's something and, yeah, okay, that has been done between Alex and Tim. Uh, that was a request sure. for the Jira Jenkins project. Is that correct? That is correct, and and it's working quite well. The fifteen plus plugins that I maintain are all now using Auto Links, and I've confirmed they work. So for those plugins that use Jira, Jenkins Jira as their bug tracker, this makes it a little easier for most of our work in Jenkins Infra is not tracked as in, in Jenkins Jira, right? We've intentionally switched to use GitHub issues. So this doesn't help us as much, but plugin maintainers like me are benefited by it if they choose to enable it themselves. Cool, thanks for the explanation. I forgot what it was about. Now it's way more clear with the explanation. Uh, clean up and import and manage Datadog monitoring in Terraform. So I'm going to be the voice of Hervé here. So thanks, Hervé, even if you're not there. Um, there have been numerous ways of creating Datadog monitors. So monitors are objects in Datadog API and UI that allows to create thresholds and conditions to alert us when these thresholds are crossed or when this, these conditions are met. For instance, when a virtual machine has an hard drive that reached the 80% of usage in terms of disk space, then it sends an alert. Uh, it, sends, it, it creates a warning alert. And if we cross the 90% threshold, that it's on the page of duty alert for us. So we recently started to, to use properly monitors and we and Hervé realized that some were as code, some were created manually, some were created magically. So we did a big cleanup on that part. Everything is managed as code from our Terraform repository. So thanks for that big cleanup Hervé. We removed false positives. And there was a hidden task behind uh, based on the feedback from both Hervé and Stefan. When we reached, a new usage, a new uh, no disk space left. I don't remember on which service, but we were using, we were still having a lot of free disk space, and we all realized that it was a full on inodes. So now, thanks for, for from your actions, folks. We have a monitor that not only monitor the free disk space, but also the free inode per device that will alert us in the future to avoid blocking a service like that problem did. So nice iteration loop, folks. I'm really, uh, really proud. And one last issue, account name. I need to spend more time on this one. Now I'll jump on the work in progress. So as usual, for each of these items, we will see if we continue working on this on the next milestone, or if we need to put back on backlog or close it because we can, that can happen. First one, migration to the cluster public gates from the former cluster. The goal was to fight against a big error message on AKS that say, hey, your network has an IP overlap that create a bunch of troubles, and it, and it did. So we are migrating services to the proper clusters. The status is that we migrated a few services during the past milestones, uh, 
including public ILT core that is now running properly on the new cluster. Here you can see the list. So we have already migrated Javadoc. Keycloak has been migrated last week without any problem. Incremental Publisher Service, which is a, basically a webhook receiver that receives messages from the pipeline library on CI Jenkins IO that tells it to get the archived artifact and publish it to Artifactory in Incremental's repository. So that service is quite widely used by our developers under the hood, so we had to migrate it and be careful with it. Uh, that has been migrated with a 10 minute downtime after letting everyone know that how it was. Uh, by the way, we should think about making it highly available. It's a stateless service, so adding a replica wouldn't kill. Jenkins weekly was already migrated. We migrated the Jenkins is the way IO redirect. I think it was already done by Hervé two weeks ago. And we were able to migrate plugin health coring. Current state, I'm just checking the last messages. Um, yes, plugin health score was done with the, also the help of Adrien. That was way efficient to have the developer of the application to be there to help us on the probes. So thanks Adrien for that. Uh, we were able to remove deleted resources to not consume a lot of memory. Uh, just a point, we had a former DNS record for javadoc jenkinsci.org or we, no, it was for wiki. One of the two websites did add the, for, the old DNS record pointing to an IP instead of being a C name to the whatever Jenkins IO name. So that broke the service after deleting the resources. So we were able to fix that. It's managed as code now, so we shouldn't have the issue anymore. And next step is to migrate to work is in progress that should be done later today. Rating Jenkins IO, which is used on the changelog uh, uh, pages of Jenkins IO when you have these ILF icons that you click to vote and rate the releases. And uplink Jenkins IO, which is used for telemetry sending from Jenkins controller all over the world so we can get some statistics. So both of these services are have the same topology they have a PostgreSQL database and two pod replica running on the cluster. So we are going to migrate both at the same time in a few, in one or two hours. I expect uh, starting to work on the critical one, LDAP and get Jenkins IO, but I will, we will decide, we decide that with Hervé when he will be back from days of tomorrow because uh, we need to be two full time for migrating these two critical services. So almost there, any question? Okay, so we continue working on this obviously until the new cluster handles all the workloads and we can clean up all the former resources. Um, next one, migrate trusted CI Jenkins IO from AWS to Azure. So we worked uh, both Stefan and, and I on this one. Uh, Stefan was my rubber duck. The world data has been migrated to the new virtual machine successfully. So the next step is to run the effective migration of trusted and see what happened. Um, a few, so the proposal date is Thursday, 1st of June. We might start tomorrow, but uh, yeah, as, as a good and really, uh, really wise tip from Stefan, maybe wait for not doing it, it a day of LTS, even a few hours after, because I'm sure the LTS will be done quickly. So that's why the proposal for Thursday. Until then, the next step will be taint the virtual machines. That means destroying and recreating machine from start to clean up every temporary tries that we might have left on the data disk that won't trash the data already migrated we won't because the data disk won't be tainted only the virtual machines um, and then we will see what will be the next steps there might be some fine tuning afterwards especially on the security groups 
But now we have reached the same quality level and same feature set as what we have on AWS. So we should be able to proceed for the next steps. Um, so that's all. That means during the, the, the operation, the update center index and the repository permission update or jobs might not be able to run as expected. So as a safety measure, I will ensure that I will run both of the jobs on the current machine to have something fresh and updated, particularly for the RPU job. And once it's built, we stop the controller, do the migration, and then try to run them separately. Most critical is the update center, but that should be quick to build and republish. And the second one will be the RPU. Most of the issues we should have after that, after that migration will be IP openings on different firewalls because it used to be a whole machine. So the new IP that will be used by its agents and its controller have changed, of course. So in a, for instance, when we will want to push to the update center virtual machine, we might need to update the configuration. So if you have word issues in publication of plugins, update centers, if you see people complaining that their plugins is not up to date on plugin Jenkins IO, starting from Thursday, that will be the main reason. Any question? No, thanks for the alert. Do we need to, and I assume that there will be some notice to people or will there be any notice to people? Yes, uh, okay. the plan includes uh, most probably that will be sent tomorrow, one day before the operation. Status Jenkins IO will be updated and an email to the mailing list of Jenkins CI dev will be sent because that one has quite the impact. So better communicating, even if everything works, I prefer uh, letting people know. Good point. Thanks uh, for the reminder. That's uh, important. Um, send email 31 of May, one day prior. All DNS has been set to with a TTL of 60 seconds for both operation, cluster, migration, and trusted. Uh, next task, install and configure Datadog plugin on CI Jenkins IO. So uh, Erwin and I worked a bit on how to make the Datadog plugin installed inside the CI Jenkins IO container to communicate in UDP with the Datadog agent running on the host machine behind. It's mostly a question of setting up the agent to listen on the proper network interface so the container can reach it on the host. Because by default, the agent only listen on localhost, which is not available. The localhost of a host machine is not available from a container. So that's only a set of finding the proper puppet setup for the agent. So it's agents.yaml configuration file will be updated to listen on the proper network interface. Uh, Hervé told me we'll be able to continue working on this on the next milestone, so I will keep that issue there. He did some successful manual tests on the machine that have been overridden since then by the agents, so it's the, in a good direction and we should be able to have way more information on CI Jenkins IO. Hervé was pretty excited about this topic because that could help a lot on the bomb build slowness and CI Jenkins IO wide behaviors. We had a question about adding a repository JITPAC. Uh, so a contributor should be able to build their own, uh, their plugin. They, uh, I haven't had time to look on this one. Most probably we will act on short term by adding an exception on ACP. So their build will, instead of trying, of ACP trying to get on our GFROG repository, it will directly bypass ACP for that specific repository. We need to help the user as soon as possible. So if it's okay for everyone, I will keep that issue on the upcoming milestone. Upgrade to Kubernetes 1.25. Um, I've started reading the change log. We might have issues with the PSP and a few depreciation. So that need to be, um, review thoroughly 
So I'm still currently trying to evaluate the impact on our clusters. Um, the idea will be planning for a Kubernetes cluster upgrade next Monday for DOKS and CI gates. So the two clusters used by CI Jenkins IO. Because this one doesn't have anything related to high availability, load balancer, or persistent volume. They don't have these three features, so that could be easy to start with them. ACP is unreliable. Uh, we didn't work on this one. So that was a time management mistake for this one. Um, right now, the next steps will be being able to have inbound agent for the Azure VM agent on CI Jenkins IO. Um, I'm keeping this one because uh, I'm sure Stefan and I can work on this uh, later than this week. Ubuntu 2204 upgrade campaign has spent some time cleaning up two of our machines uh, that are ready to be upgraded. These machines are the two OSU OSL machines, meaning um, uh, Lettuce and uh, Edamame. The proposal is uh, migrating this one as soon as possible because they don't host any service, so better up the upgrading them. The idea is that if the upgrade goes properly, that means we can immediately jump and update on Puppet Jenkins IO, which is also a virtual machine updated on OSU OSL. Why these three machines are special? They are virtual machines or bare metal machine, I'm not sure. I think it's virtual machine hosted by the OSU OSL organization, which is a University of Oregon. The question is, if we upgrade in place the distribution and reboot, will the kernel work with the virtual machine hypervisor behind? So if we lose a Damame or Lettuce, that's not a problem. And we will ask them, and we will know what is required for the upgrade before breaking Puppet Jenkins Soyo. That could be way more annoying. Uh, Pet the Jenkins radish. Um, support Linux container when running Windows virtual machine. Oh, I forgot this one. Need to try to install Docker with Docker desktop instead of Docker C on Windows Packer images. That should be a few lines. And Stefan, finally, IRM64 not pull on publicates to start using IRM64 pods for the production work website workload. Can you give up a heads up on this one? Yes, I started a PR to um, to define as uh, um, oh sorry to define the new uh, not pool. Uh, the the main uh, problem, not really a problem was to find the correct machine to use as an IRM uh, node. Uh, we worked a lot on, on uh, disk size and uh, memory and CPU to uh, define the correct one. I think we find we found the good one. So uh, it should, uh, it should uh, go uh, ahead now. And maybe we will have to uh, We'll work a little on, on a, a new node pool for the Intel one to just rename the node pools and to have something more um, coherent. Yep, homogeneous. homogeneous. Is that okay for you to prioritize once the node pool is created successfully? Because you know, with Terraform and Azure, we know that sometimes the plan says, ah, oh, I should create these resources. And when it's time to create them, it fails <laughs> with whatever error, and then you have to iterate. So once created successfully, a proposal is then you start working on how could we tell Kubernetes to use IRM image for the Javadoc Nginx image. Okay, that's not an easy one. <laughs> okay. Um, again, the goal of that issue is to execute some of our workloads 
websites mostly, or static websites on IRM64 machine instead of Intel. So we can decrease the costs per request or the cost, uh, absolute cost of these workloads. Now I'm removing the backlog. Let's cover the triage and new issues. Mark, I think you can start because I saw you open an issue about bomb issue, uh, bomb problems earlier today. Is that correct? Yes. So, so, and I think you mentioned something that may help in in your earlier comments. I'm not sure. So, what we see is that attempts to release the Jenkins plugin bill of materials failed over the weekend on three different attempts. Each attempt failed taking seven, seven and a half to up to nine hours uh, oh. to, to attempt to do the run. Uh, previous releases that had been successful with this configuration took six hours. And so there may be some change that has caused things in the last seven or eight days to become slower we will take some actions on the bill of materials side. Right now we're, we're supporting four release lines, 361, 375, 387, and 401. We will very soon drop 361. So that should reduce our runtime somewhat right there immediately. Uh, but there may have been other changes that are worth, are worth further consideration in the infra team, right? The, the problem here may go away just by the changes we'll make on the bill of materials to reduce from four configurations to three. But if it doesn't, we'll then need help. Okay, so we will still need to look at the logs and see what happened because between the eventually the um, uh, spot, uh, the spot instances uh, eviction rate that could have uh, grown on these instances so we can check uh, this and also um yeah i fear that we will still uh, be in the the uh, stuck with the the concurrent for resources on ci jenkins io when there is a bomb build and when the step starts to to take absolutely uh, unexpected times for simple steps that should take seconds and that takes minutes I'm sure we are in that kind of locks. So yeah, for that one, we need to focus on the new CI Jenkins IO instance. That should be a first step and the work that Hervé did with the, is doing with the Datadog thing. We might have Datadog helping us on monitoring what is going wrong in that controller. Great. Yeah, so, so there, are, there are plans already for the bomb to take some actions. The oh, Tim Jacome even replied to my to that one saying, "Hey, we don't even need to wait for the release of 2.401.1. We could drop 2.361 immediately." And okay. and I think it's a valid a valid statement because 2.361 has no known security vulnerabilities, and users should be running 3.75 or newer. Actually, they should be running by now 3.87. To decrease time needs to investigate that the dog plugin could help. Okay. So I've added this one on the upcoming milestone. Now we have um, a request by Gavin from Matomo, GitHub Docker repositories. Yes. <laughs> He created a repository and we removed it because uh, we didn't add news for months on that topic, even after asking him. So he recreated everything. So we have to edit this and I will take or we will take a, just scan uh, the state, the configuration state of that repository and everything. Um, I assume it's the part of, for replacing Google Analytics by Matomo, which is back in the pipe. Yes, that exactly. will help us on not depending because it looks like even Olivier doesn't have access on Google Analytics. So yeah, he don't he doesn't have enough permissions to grant me admin on to migrate some of the properties. These are objects inside the Google Analytics API, as I understand. So we will have to wait on July for automatic migration by Google Analytics themselves. But that was a discussion, and Hervé was willing to help. Uh, to 
to have our own Matomo service. I understand that Olivier Vernon ran Matomo for the past two years for update CLI and Gavin also on his own. So that should be a service to host on our cluster. The next step will be we need, and I will ask explicitly Gavin on, on here, what do we need for running the, the cluster? Because there is no reason for hosting and building a Docker image if we don't run it somewhere. And we need to know the requirement for running Matomo in production based on his experience. So by default, I'm adding it to the next milestone, assuming that Hervé uh, uh, expressed some interest one or two weeks ago when we discussed that topic. If I'm mistaken, we will remove it and let Gavin walk or just say no or move it on backlog. That's not top priority, but important because Gavin is able to spend some time with us now for the bootstrap, so better to, to use that precious time. Uh, Mark, you open an issue about artifactory bandwidth assessment. Oh, I forgot to work on this today. Oh, crap. I have a bit too much thing. So the idea is after uh, a meeting with GFrog uh, last week, we have two brownout session to do. So brownout will be us changing a major setting on the repositories and see the effects on both the build on the infrastructure and the build from the outside contributor. Brownout is uh, between uh, blackout and uh, I don't know, is whiteout existing? So between nominal condition and everything broken. The goal is for one hour, so we, we let user know a few days ago that that day during one hour, we will change that setting that might have that impact and will most probably break your builds because we want to see how it breaks. Um, the first one will be once validated with the one time with the gigit repository to see if we can dis disable the maven repo one making it private only for artifactory that uh, repository is you um, is used on the virtual repository public that everyone should use we are not absolutely sure but it looks like that some users are directly calling that repository from repo org slash repo slash maven repo one they should use public there could be two kind of usage for a direct call to that virtual repository the first one is misconfiguration of pom xml or settings xml and that one if it breaks it's okay because that need it will need fixing by using public if it's a valid and expected use case and the second case is abusive use case that costs us bandwidth somehow so we need to check if we can disable Maven repo one. So we will do a test on Jigit and then a brownout of this one to see if it breaks things. Is, is that a good summary, Mark, for the first step? Yes, that is. And then the second, the second brownout will be removing Maven repo one from even the public virtual repository at all and see the impact. But that that will mean will need that one will need more details, because one thing for sure is that if the abusive use case switch from the direct Maven repo one and they realize they can use public, that will just shift the problem from one repo to the other, and we need to see why do we have a mirror of Maven repo one today. That one might need some uh, fine tuning of the ACP though, because ACP. If they cannot find, if it cannot find uh, an artifact, then it will need either to fail abruptly and then we fix the POM XML dependency, or eventually directly have ACP downloading artifact from Maven repo one instead of our GFrog repo and caching everything still to keep the caching on an infrastructure. So, we have to move this one to this week milestone because the goal will be to do the first brownouts uh, this week. Is is still okay for you, Mark, if we target uh, Thursday or Friday? Yes, yeah, I think so. I would have a preference for Friday if it's okay for you. And Friday uh, sounds great. 
So uh, Damien, the, yes. the Friday brownout, it's still okay if we just do the JGIT one. We think that's relatively low impact on the Jenkins mm -hmm. project overall. Yes. So JGIT for Friday, and based on the feedback, we plan to do a, the brownout of Maven repo one, the direct one next week. Is that okay for you? That yeah, that that should be fine. Monday or Tuesday next week for the Maven repo one. Timing proposal discussed during. The... Well, and and it doesn't even have to be that early in the week next week because we won't have an LTS that week. We could do we could do it Wednesday. Oh yes, but I I will prefer doing the brownout as soon as possible so we can mm. give feedback to Gfrog as soon as possible. Okay, great. Chigit brown out uh, thing on Friday two. Yep, Friday two June brown out and Maven. Maven repo one brown out uh, for the five of the or the six is that is that okay? Yes. Yeah, but that's Maven repo one cache. Uh, yes, that that's the same thing. Maven repo one. We no. we don't have administrative on the Maven repo one. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, fine. we would need more money clearly. <laughs> Um, it, the dash cache is a suffix that implies that it's a caching of the original Maven repo one external mirror. But that's the same uh, wording I use abusive wording for mentioning that mirror repository. So we don't need more triage. What do we have in trade? Find a way to monitor job done from private controller. Yes, that doesn't need triage. And so it's the... not the priority. There yes, was sorry. one that was raised in chat just minutes ago by uh, Gavin Mogan on the Matamo. 3602. Did it already get covered? It's Matamo, um, yes. It, okay, so I, I hadn't seen it in the notes, and so I added it to the notes. Okay. Real time check. Perfect, thanks. Uh, yeah, I added it to the milestone, but I forgot to cherry pick to the notes. Mm, great. Uh, let me add the access artifactory. Um, so find a way to monitor job done for private controller. Uh, it's a, a kind of next logical step of the CI Jenkins IO connection to the Datadog plugins that should give way more information to Datadog about the internals of Jenkins, the amount of job, failing jobs that could allow us to monitor critical jobs. For instance, when the bomb takes more than 10 hours, we could have a monitor in Datadog letting us know. That's a practical example. But for some private and sensitive controllers, such as Trusted CI and Release CI, as infrastructure officer, I refuse to enable the Datadog plugin at that level of detail. We can have Datadog plugins sending virtual machine metrics saying, oh, that sensitive virtual machine is using a lot of CPU. That information is okay. Sending internals of a Jenkins controller that could or could not, depending on the accidentally set up by someone, Unexpected, uh, unexpected backup of credential in Datadog is a scenario that could happen at, that we don't want, specifically for update center. We don't want an unexpected backup of the update center certificates, right? So we need to find a way. There, there used to be a proposal by Daniel that might have been an issue or private conversation, I can't remember. So I've shared that with Hervé. The idea will be to each of these sensitive jobs that we want to monitor will need a post build step that just write a few selected information, the date when it ran, the status, whatever information that are not sensitive inside our, uh, uh, I think we have a public bucket with file, with JSON file used for the reports. We can write without any risk for the safety of this controller, the status of the latest update center build or RPU builds, and then build a Datadog monitor that say, hey, if after 15 minutes, the update center 
uh, last build last, success, last successful build hasn't been updated, then send an alert. We can build that kind of two-step process. So that's not top priority, but that will be really useful for us to track this, these jobs and helps developer because we can fix the element before error happen. So that's why I propose we don't start working on this. We don't have time for this milestone, remove triage, but that one is interesting to track. Uh, Jitpack should not have triage anymore. Uh, it's CI Jenkins IO and it's on the new milestone. Okay, I don't see any new issues. We are removed Docker Hub pool credential from Kubernetes cluster. So for that one, I'm removing triage, but not adding to the milestone because we won't have time. Credential. Okay, so do we have new issues, new element you want to speak about and add to the milestone or to triage? No, for me. I got I got one last item uh, that need to be tracked on a new issue. I will take care of opening it and adding it. We received the pull request uh, from Alex. I will sync with Alex for the implementation to see if we have to do it. Um, Alex and team are working are heavily working on weekly CI Jenkins IO, which is a public instance and a public demonstrator of the new Jenkins design, UX, UI, et cetera, the many the design language thing. And uh, they want to make anyone being able to have the system read so we can show the UI of the system administration, the new UI, which is a valid and legit use case. Thing is, that could risk and that would risk people being able to access some encrypted credential. Even if the credentials are encrypted, that will give them some specific uh, permission. We are not completely sure, but I'm not really willing to try because we are in a sensitive area. Giving read access to the system configuration should give you access to Gcask export as far as I can tell which has an export of the encrypted credentials. Our credentials could be on some fields. I don't know exactly how the permission work, but as a matter of safety, my proposal is I don't want to block that new thing, but before I would prefer first stop using LDAP authentication for that instance and switch to uh, the local Jenkins user database. So we would have an admin and a shared password for the administration. So the LDAP binding password, would there, there will be no chance to expose that password. And the second credential that could be risky is the GitHub app token. But as Tim said, we could do remove it or it's fine to, to have that risk there because it's a really fine grain GitHub app. So my proposal is to change the configuration of weekly CI. So it doesn't use LDAP anymore and it doesn't use any credential on top level unless there will be public credential for demonstration. So then we couldn't have any risk of anyone accessing sensitive credentials here. So the, the, the real concern or the, the, the remaining concern seems to be that LDAP binding credential. And that we, the only way to stop using that is to stop using LDAP as the authentication system. Okay. Exactly. Because on the paper, that permission shouldn't expose credential on the paper. Mm -hmm. But once the credential is exposed, that's annoying because that's a public instance, so yeah better. And also, I want to suggest to um, Tim and Alex that we could create a Yumi agent. So that will mean a SSH agent machine running outside Kubernetes that could be a tiny virtual machine somewhere if they need to demonstrate the UI of the nodes of the nodes pages. But that's not for now.
So yes, that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to add? No? Okay. So then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna stop recording. And for people watching this recording, see you next week. Bye-bye.